Stuart Preston, and this is the Consciousness Podcast, where each week I have a conversation with an expert in human consciousness. This week, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. George Mashore. Dr. Mashore is an anesthesiologist and neuroscientist who is internationally recognized for his study of consciousness. He approaches the question of consciousness using computational models, experimental models, translational studies in healthy volunteers, and clinical research in surgical patients. He thinks a lot about the universe and how it came to be, about the brain, how it produces consciousness, and how the sentient mind emerges from the physical brain. We covered those topics and more, so please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Mashore. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm I'm honored. I I can tell you since I started this podcast um, middle to late last year, I've been uh, very humbled by the people who have been willing to take some time and, and talk with me about consciousness. So I, I'm really grateful that you're doing so as well. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right. So my first question is, um, you know, how did you come to study consciousness specifically? I mean, it's, I've talked to philosophers and neuroscientists, and you're the first anesthesiologist that I'll be talking to is, you know, is consciousness something you've always been interested in or did it come to you as an anesthesiologist and working with your patients? How did, how did this become a focus of yours? So thanks for asking. Uh, I actually started off studying philosophy as an undergraduate and Hmm. very specifically in my junior year of college, I read the critique of pure reason by Immanuel Kant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, And that just blew my mind. Um, that's when I really started developing a deep and abiding interest uh, in the subject of consciousness. And not only was that the stimulus, but uh, the work of Kant has actually informed my thinking neuroscientifically about consciousness. So that evolved um, as I started to realize that I, I was interested in a career in science and medicine, which I'd never imagined before. Um, and, and started to explore fields that would help me better understand consciousness. So I worked in uh, a neurosurgeon's lab. My PhD mentor was a neurosurgeon. Uh, I thought about neurology. I first uh, matched into the field of psychiatry because I thought psychiatry would be uh, a good balance between neuroscience and medicine and philosophy. But ultimately, I I switched out. I got more clinically interested in acute care medicine, and I was struggling with the field I should choose. And one of my fellow interns said, hey, you should think about anesthesiology. You're a neuroscientist. You're interested in consciousness. You know, this is a great field where you can really live it every day uh, by modulating people's consciousness. And so I switched from psychiatry to anesthesiology, and then ultimately decided to focus my research career in this topic as well. Um, it, you would think that every anesthesiologist and every neuroscientist would be interested in the topic of consciousness, uh, but in yeah. fact, still a pretty small group. Um, you know, if you think about you know the people who show up at a national anesthesiology meeting where you have fifteen thousand to, uh, to twenty thousand just in that discipline you know, the consciousness community is still pretty small and for a long time was delegitimized. It's still even kind of on the fringe. Um, So even in fields where you would expect that everybody would be interested in it, sometimes they're just a handful of people uh, who are really committed uh, to studying it and understanding it scientifically. Right. Well, that's interesting. So you came at it from a different, almost backwards from what my assumption was. I thought from being an anesthesiologist, you would naturally observe changes in consciousness, but you actually came at it from philosophy from your undergraduate studies. Yeah, that's right. Actually, I pretty specifically became an anesthesiologist because of my study in philosophy, and you probably don't hear that much. No, actually, I've I've never heard it, but uh, I haven't talked to a lot of anesthesiologists at this point. So given that, I think that I find that interesting. So I I tend to ask, there's a couple questions in here that I tend to ask everybody. And one of them is is how you define consciousness. So as you look at this and as you've studied it from your perspective and and now, you know, having from that philosophical background, 
How do you define consciousness? What is consciousness? Great question. We could spend hours and hours talking about the different uses of that word, definitions, um, and confusions uh, in the literature. I think at the end of the day, most of us in the field, at, at the very core, uh, define consciousness as experience, as qualitative subjective experience, or mm. often refer to what it's like, uh, the feeling of what it's like to be in a certain mental state. Um, An awareness. Awareness. Uh, it, it's hard to define specifically. Mm -hmm. I think we all know what we're talking about, though, when we talk about experience and subjectivity. Uh, but certainly, you know, when you talk about how I would define it operationally, that's where things become more complicated. Uh, because, and this is one of the foundational problems in the field, I don't necessarily have an objective measure. All I'm really measuring is behavior right now. So, mm -hmm. In one of our experiments, or, or the kinds of experiments that we do, we study healthy volunteers uh, and we monitor their brains and give them various anesthetics. So how am I defining consciousness there? Well, I'm defining it by their ability to uh, squeeze my hand, for example, in response to a command uh, before they get the anesthetic, uh, to squeeze it again in, in an apparently orderly way after the anesthetic is discontinued. Uh, but there's the rub, as they would say, uh, because I'm measuring behavior, but what I really want to capture is subjectivity. And the problem is uh, those two uh, aspects, responsiveness and consciousness, can sometimes be dissociated. So you can have somebody who's not responsive uh, and yet could be having a, a vivid conscious experience, either in the world or a disconnected conscious state uh, such as a, a dream. So philosophically or existentially, I think, you know, we know how to define consciousness as experience, uh, the feeling of what it's like to be in a certain mental state operationally or experimentally. Oftentimes we're linking it to uh, a point of behavior uh, and responsiveness, um, and that is problematic. In fact, it's part of what motivates um, and understanding of the neuroscience of consciousness. If we understood the principles and the neuroscientific or neural instantiation of those principles, then maybe we could come up with a way to measure consciousness or the capacity for consciousness independent of uh, responsiveness or behavior. And that's of interest and importance for two reasons. Traditionally, we wanted to figure out uh, if someone was conscious when they didn't appear to be conscious, so in my field, for example, a patient who might have a paralytic drug that's necessary for their surgery so they can't move or respond when, in fact, they have awareness of what's going on. How do we detect their subjective state independently of their response, or in this case, their inability to respond? Right. What we have in the 21st century is uh, the other side of the coin. As we get more and more sophisticated with things like Siri or, or operating systems, uh, machines, artificial intelligence, uh, and behavior starts to look more and more like conscious experience, again, we need a principled way, independently of behavior that's suggestive of consciousness, uh, to be able to discriminate between what is and, and what isn't consciousness. Yeah, that's interesting. And actually, it leads me to a question that's actually not on my list here. Um, but Dr. Tononi over at uh, Wisconsin has in his, uh, I think it's integrated information theory, um, supposedly him and Christoph Koch are developing a way to, to actually measure consciousness in humans. Are you familiar with that at all? Oh, yes. I'm very familiar with um, Professor Tononi's integrated information theory and uh, would count myself as one of the early adopters in, in trying to um, educate the field of anesthesiology regarding it. Uh, and our team has also done some work of using the, the principles of that theory uh, to achieve a practical measurement of phi, uh, what 
he denotes as a, a capacity for consciousness. So, right. Yes, that that would be another implication of their work and something that they're thinking about. Okay. Um, you had mentioned that the brain knows and does not know certain things at certain levels of consciousness. Is that uh, part of what you're talking about here? As you see, you know, patients going in and out of consciousness. You know, their their body may be in paralysis, but maybe they're still aware. Um, what are the different things that you've you've seen or studied about what the brain knows and does not know at these different levels of consciousness? So, uh, first of all, I want to make a distinction um, between um, a different stage or different level of consciousness and it, that dissociation between behavior and consciousness. So, in the case okay. of intraoperative awareness, um, in many cases, or in some cases, there's um, there's not really a different state of consciousness. It's just that consciousness has become uh, uncoupled from the ability to respond and express oneself. Uh, in, in the okay. field of neurology, somebody who has locked-in syndrome, for example, doesn't have a disorder of consciousness per se, but rather uh, has a disorder in being able to uh, express um, what's going on in their mind. And so that's one issue uh, that's important and needs to be studied. Uh, the other topic or issue that you bring up is kind of the spectrum of conscious experience. And uh, there's a wide uh, array or wide repertoire of different states that can be accessed um, in, in the period before and after anesthesia. So it's not just that the light's on and then the light's off and then the light is back on again. Uh, people right. can dream during anesthesia. Uh, different anesthetics hmm. have different properties. So for example, something like ketamine can have strong psychoactive or even psychedelic effects. Um, some patients recover incompletely. Uh, they could have uh, delirium. Um, so it, there are lots of gray areas and, and nuances in terms of the subjective states that happen uh, around the time of general anesthesia and surgery. Okay. And these states are the, are the states themselves um, clearly defined or, I mean, that's something you can say like, uh, here are the states of consciousness. So there really hasn't been, well, first of all, I'd say no, they're not clearly defined. Um, again, part of the, problem with studying consciousness or states of consciousness is you're often dependent on verbal report. Um, it's difficult to right. have the objective indices. There could be, for example, a diagnosis of delirium that is grounded and evidence-based, but more as a matter of convention. Um, you know, there's a spectrum even within that diagnosis, a spectrum of severity. So there isn't, I think, a very clear cartography of uh, the different types of experiences, although they, you know, they have been studied uh, in a variety of different ways. Okay. Um, what about the, can we talk a little bit about cognitive binding or the binding problem? Sure. Um, so that is something that really grew out of my, uh, my interest in that topic grew out of my interest in Immanuel Kant. So, in Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, he talks about how the mind has different faculties that process and give form to different aspects of the world, and yet our conscious experience is seamless, it's unified, it's integrated. So it's complex, but it's integrated. If you fast forward a couple of hundred, a couple of centuries uh, from Kant and publishing the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781 to the early 1980s, neuroscientists and also physicists who were thinking about this, like Christoph von Malsberg, uh, were thinking about, well, how does, the, how does the brain integrate all this information? We have this seamless, unified, conscious experience, and yet, while well, Kant talked about the mind, we know that the brain has a kind of division of labor um, where different sensory modalities and submodalities are getting processed in discrete areas 
uh, in different brain regions. Right. So people started to ask the question, specifically with respect to visual perception, how does the brain bind this together in order to get to a unified experience? So I became interested in that when I was in graduate school as that conversation or, or discourse was unfolding in the literature. And then when I was starting my residency in anesthesiology, I was thinking about some of the, the main questions in that field. And one of them was, how do anesthetics work? Um, and there are a variety of different explanatory levels. And coming from my background with an interest in consciousness, um, how the brain integrates information, the cognitive binding problem, et cetera, um, and just as a brief digression, that really evolved in some respects into the integrated information theory. I think mm. it's fair to say that Giulio Tononi was also heavily influenced by Kant in a number of different ways. Um, mm. uh, but at any rate, when I was starting to think about the mechanisms of anesthesia and how these pharmacologically and uh, neuroscientifically diverse drugs were all able to induce um, if not exactly the same experiential state, then a very similar functional state in the operating room. I wasn't thinking about it um, from the molecular level or the biophysical level uh, as much of the field was, but rather uh, thinking about the, the systems of the neural substrates of consciousness and specifically experience in the brain and how anesthetics might disrupt that uh, experiential processing. Um, so early on in my training, I proposed it was in a kind of theoretical article uh, that anesthetics fundamentally act um, to unbind perception and to take uh, an, an integrated field of information and to make that uh, more modular, that is more isolated cognitive modules. So this was really more of a, a theoretical exercise for me. I didn't have a laboratory, I was in my training, uh, but it seemed to make sense that uh, different anesthetics, even though they might have been binding to different molecules, they had these different properties, they could potentially all converge in, uh, to a uh, final common pathway of um, disconnecting or unbinding uh, the kinds of cognitive processes that were required for consciousness. So when I started uh, as a faculty member, I trained at the Massachusetts General Hospital where uh, surgery under anesthesia was first publicly demonstrated, came to the University of Michigan for a fellowship and a, a faculty um, in anesthesiology and also in neuroscience, I realized that I had to take those qualitative um, reflections and that qualitative framework of cognitive unbinding as a potential mechanism and turn it into something that could be quantitative. And uh, I did that by uh, recruiting, as, as one of the first people I recruited to my laboratory, a physicist from South Korea, Unshul Lee, uh, who had a specific expertise in complex systems uh, and in network science and the mathematical mm -hmm. formalism of network science called graph theory. And so in those early days, Unchul and I worked uh, to come up with frameworks of how uh, anesthetic state transitions um, could affect networks or, or representations of networks in the brain and what the ultimate implications might be for information processing. And by following that line of investigation, uh, probably about five years after we started working together, we were able to identify uh, a common neural correlate across diverse anesthetics representing major classes of anesthetics. And so that there have been other such studies with, with uh, different metrics, um, but our ability to identify in a theory-based way a common neural correlate of uh, the drug sebofluorine, propofol, and ketamine, um, I thought was quite striking. And even if that correlate didn't necessarily uh, serve as the, um, the underlying mechanism for losing consciousness, uh, I 
thought it pointed to the possibility of a common proximate cause that these diverse mechanistic pathways uh, might converge upon. And so when these, when, when all these, just so I can understand, the cognitive binding, um, is, is it a physical binding that results in what we experience as consciousness or is consciousness one of the components that is bound to the other components? Yes, very interesting question. I think it, in its original formulation, uh, it was the question of how um, information got bound together in order to result in the seamless experience uh, of consciousness. Okay. So to, to be more concrete, so you've got visual processing going on in the back of the brain in, in the visual cortex and auditory processing in the temporal lobe. So how does that information um, get connected together? Or how do the different features, even, even if we just stuck to vision, how do the different features and processing pathways um, come together such that we've got a, a stable visual perception? And there were two answers, and I think they're important in their categories. One's a spatial answer, and the other is a temporal answer. The spatial answer uh, was referred to as binding by convergence. And what that means is uh, information at some lower order or primary area of the brain would converge to another higher order area, and that area would help integrate this information. And there's some advantages and disadvantages of, of postulating that as a mechanism for binding. Uh, the other category uh, gave a temporal answer. That is, um, information didn't get to the same space in order to get integrated. It gets processed in a coordinated way in time, binding by synchrony. Now, we know that synchrony per se uh, likely is not necessary or sufficient for conscious experience, but I think that most of us would agree that precise temporal coordination is critical. Yeah, and is that the simultaneity that you, you mentioned? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it does make sense. Have you seen, in, you know, other than um, anesthetics, have you seen anything else that can, that can unbind all, all these different components? Well, um, you know, so instead of talking about um, unbinding per se, let's talk about the, the surrogate that we use for information getting integrated, and that is through various functional connectivity patterns in the brain. So what are we actually measuring? Typically, we're measuring uh, some kind of um, state of connectivity, that is different regions of the brain, how they correlate, how the activities correlate. And if you look at, for example, the anesthetics that I mentioned, seboforine, propofol, ketamine, you can find both by EEG and by fMRI that there's a functional disconnection between the frontal or prefrontal cortex and the posterior parietal cortex. Well, you can see some similar functional disconnections with other states to get to your question of, you know, do you see this outside of anesthesia? So, for example, uh, sleep, uh, you see a reduction in connectivity and an increase in modularity, that is, the number of isolated or more isolated modules in the brain. Certain pathologic states of unconsciousness, such as um, what was formerly referred to as the vegetative state, but now more commonly referred to as unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, you can also see this um, network change. And these changes are um, common. I'm not saying that the states are all the same, but you do see some common elements, and these elements of uh, a greater modularity or functional disconnections or reduced network efficiency all point to network conditions that would likely be inhospitable to information processing and information synthesis. Okay. That does make more sense. Um, 
Anything else on, on that before I move on to the next question? Uh, no, please move on. Okay. All right. Um, in your work, and, and I think I think I'm starting to get a, a good picture of what the answer might be here. But as you you know administer anesthesia and then you watch patients come out from the effects of the anesthesia, do you feel like you've been able to observe in any way the the emergence? of consciousness, kind of like the way somebody would come out of sleep. You know, do you, do you observe that emergence as it's coming about? Is there anything noticeable that you can observe? And I guess kind of where I'm going with that is, does it give you any kind of insight into the initial emergence of consciousness in, in a newborn as the brain develops and, you know, whether, I don't know if that's, you know, if we know when consciousness emerges, but do you feel like you may have got, gained any kind of insight into that, that emergence? So that's a very interesting question. I think um, a lot of people in the field are now focused on the question of emergence. Uh, mm -hmm. Before the question was, well, what, what's getting shut off uh, when you go from the state of wakefulness to the state of unconsciousness? And that's a really interesting question, but it's also important to remember that there are lots of other things getting shut off. So when I become unconscious, let's say due to an anesthetic, I've got lots of other changes in my brain. So right now we're engaged in this conversation uh, regarding consciousness. I'm going to have all sorts of neural activity that's devoted to that cognitively, but it not, might not really be related to my perceptual experience of the world. So uh, a number of investigators have said, well, what's going on during emergence? Now you're getting from the state of oblivion um, to just that primordial or core consciousness. And right. um, so some investigators have looked at that with PET scanning and found that, you know, there are these uh, evolutionarily conserved areas uh, in the brainstem and, and the subcortical areas that seem to be turned on with more limited uh, neocortical activity and connectivity than you see affected on, on the way down or going under the anesthetic. So that's been interesting that the asymmetries between the induction of anesthesia and the emergence from anesthesia are of interest. But getting to your question, I and my colleague, Dr. Michael Alkire, who um, is a generation above me and was one of the pioneers in thinking about consciousness and anesthesia, we asked a very similar question. Can the emergence of consciousness that we can observe reproducibly, that we can study uh, with a neuroimaging technique or electroencephalography or magnetoencephalography, can that serve as a reproducible model uh, to give us insight into the emergence of consciousness across phylogeny. So not just across uh, a time span of minutes where I'm waking up from sleep or anesthesia, um, but over the course of millions of years. And so what we did is we tried to um, get a sense from the literature of the core, just fundamental requirements uh, for a primordial conscious experience as, as measured in humans, and then identify where those neural correlates might appear across phylogeny. Um, and so this was a very interesting exercise for me uh, as an anesthesiologist, even as a neuroscientist, uh, to be thinking mm -hmm. about the comparative neuroscience and the evolutionary neuroscience. Uh, but this question of when consciousness evolved um, goes back certainly at least to the time of Charles Darwin, who really struggled uh, with this question of mental evolution in parallel uh, to that of biological evolution. So I do think uh, that there is um, something to be gained by exploring some of the neurobiology of emergence from anesthesia uh, to see how it might be applied to phylogeny or to ontogeny, as you mentioned, a development uh, of the individual human, um, mm -hmm. and then comparing it uh, between different species. Uh, so you know, I don't want to be simplistic and say that it's going to answer all questions, uh, 
but I think when you um, when you grapple with the difficulty of figuring out when consciousness might have emerged, uh, I think what we had proposed was uh, an interesting strategy. Well, yeah, interesting. And I, I think uh, it does sound like a lot of different things are coming together to potentially, you know, start to build that reproducible model. So I'm pretty excited to hear to hear what you guys are doing on that. Um, I watched a, a video of you presenting. I think it was at the Science of Consciousness event. And in that, you mentioned uh, ego dissolution with ketamine. And I wonder what, you know, what that means to you. What, what is the ego and how it relates to consciousness and, and what happens with, you know, the dissolution of the ego and during that period? Yeah, great questions. Big questions. Um, this is speaking to really a remarkable dimension of neuroscience that's happening now, and that is the neuroscience of the psychedelic experience, where uh, these techniques of imaging and dynamics uh, are are being brought to bear on the question of um, how psychedelic drugs work in the brain and what the psychedelic experience can tell us about the organization or the nature of consciousness itself. Um, in phenomenological terms, uh, this ego dissolution is the sense that I, I don't have the same hard boundaries uh, between the, the subjective, what's going on within me, the world around me, uh, that uh, there's a certain kind of expansiveness, sometimes referred to as oceanic boundlessness and, and some of the mm. um, instruments to, to capture some canonical traits of the psychedelic experience. Um, so this is a, a you know, fairly consistent report, uh, as I understand it, in, in different altered states or, or psychedelic states of consciousness. Um, Robert, uh, uh, Robin, excuse me, Robin Carhart Harris, um, from the UK has been doing some really incredible work on, on neuroimaging and um, some of the dynamics of the psychedelic experience. And what he and other colleagues found is that the degree to which you have this sense of your ego dissolving uh, or your sense of self expanding, you see this reduction in alpha oscillations in the brain uh, and alpha is around 10 hertz, so 10 cycles per second. And if you and I had an EEG on right now and we closed our eyes, you'd see this beautiful alpha oscillation um, in the back of our brains. So this was really interesting and striking to me because I had been grappling with this question of ketamine, which is very distinct from more traditional anesthetic drugs and trying to figure out what was common. But there was kind of a parallel question going on in the psychedelic literature because ketamine has psychedelic effects at sub-anesthetic doses and yet it is uh, not like the classical um, serotonergic um, drug uh, as you might find with psilocybin or LSD. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's common to them? Well, I remember from our studies that uh, ketamine also reduced alpha power and that's distinct from other anesthetics where you see this strong increase in alpha power, especially in the frontal area um, when you're anesthetized. So I started wondering whether or not the suppression of alpha power might be a common uh, neurophysiological trait between uh, you know, a classical uh, or canonical psychedelic drug like psilocybin or LSD and a non-classical or non-canonical drug such as ketamine. So that's something that that we've been exploring um, and have found, uh, as others have, uh, that ketamine uh, reduces um, alpha uh, in certain areas that might account for the, the kinds of phenomenology that you have with ketamine, such as a, a, um, an altered ego or disembodiment, uh, which is a very strong feature of, of the ketamine experience. So some have posited, Robin Carhart Harris, for example, and others, um, that this might tell us something about the role of alpha as an oscillation and kind of constraining the brain um, 
and, and limiting its possibilities as we're walking around in daily life. I mean, I think we know this intuitively. We can't, you know, we can't um, be getting too out there in our experience or in our thinking if we want to get things done. We have to stay on task or stay focused, if you will. And right. uh, what he was suggesting, he and his uh, colleagues, uh, was that alpha might help to constrain um, the brain and constrain the repertoire of available states. And that when you start suppressing alpha with these psychedelic drugs, the brain is able to access um, it, its wider repertoire of experiential states. So, uh, you know, a very interesting uh, recent trend in the past several years um, focusing on psychedelic neuroscience. Uh, and I think ketamine is especially interesting because depending on the dose, it can function either as an anesthetic, which alters a level of consciousness, uh, or psychedelic, right. which alters the content of consciousness. Um, and just a, a historical note, um, a ketamine was really introduced into practice here at the University of Michigan uh, in the 1960s, where it was first studied in humans. Interesting. And um, just not totally related to consciousness, or maybe it is, do you, do you guys also study ketamine as it uh, is um, being applied today as a, a therapy for um, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts? Uh, yes, actually, um, I and my colleague, Dr. Michael Abaddon from Washington University, have been um, analyzing uh, the results of um, a multi-center randomized control trial uh, regarding the effects of ketamine that's given during surgery. So this is not in a psychiatric population, but in a population of surgical patients. How does ketamine given during the case affect mood and depressive symptoms in the post-operative period. So that is a topic of uh, active investigation in our research group. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. I know my, um, as a layman, my, my wife has been doing a lot of studies on ketamine and ketamine therapy, you know, for, especially for those with suicidal thoughts. So I thought it was interesting when, you know, to hear what you've been saying about it as, you know, one level of ketamine, you know, affects the level of consciousness and the other one affects um, I don't remember, it wasn't the level, but the access to different pieces of parts of, of consciousness. I thought that was interesting within, possibly within that context of uh, therapy. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, just a couple more questions. One, one is just kind of an open-ended one for you, but um, one question, another question I like to ask, and I'm not, I don't know if I see it here, but um, do you think there's any way that we're going to be able to use some of the insights that you're providing to us as a way to, for humans, either individually or, or you know, as a species to um, affect consciousness, you know, to exercise it, to expand it, even possibly, you know, connect it outside of the brain. You know, I, I just interviewed um, Dr. Dean Radin uh, last week, and I, I don't know if you saw him at that same conference, but, you know, he had that famous double slit experiment with uh, consciousness affecting the outcome of the, the famous quantum physics double slit experiment. And so I wondered if, you know, if in your studies that, you know, not maybe not something that you've studied, you know, directly, but in your own mind, if you thought, you know, this could have the, you know, great ramifications in the future, if we're able to, you know, change this or affect this or connect something. I mean, do you see anything even approaching, you know, you it might, might consider it sci-fi today, but you, in your own mind, you're thinking, we might be able to do this because of the, the results I'm seeing. So, great question. Um, I, I'm going to give you an answer that's not so sci-fi, if you don't mind. Okay, good. Uh, no, I, please. I think it would be ambitious, um, but within reach. So, I'm going to not talk about kind of connecting us externally, but more to the question of, how can we modulate brain networks in order to change conscious experience? And I want to focus on a, what I consider personally a, a disorder of consciousness experience, and that is chronic pain. Now, pain and consciousness mm -hmm. are intimately linked. Pain is a state of consciousness, uh, and that's what distinguishes it from nociception, which is the body uh, 
uh, registering uh, a noxious stimulus. And in patients who have chronic pain, unlike if I punched you in the arm or I you know, put a needle in your, your leg, you, there would be a, a, a clear and identifiable source for your painful experience. Right. A patient with chronic pain, by contrast, might take a normal sensation like light touch and turn it into a painful experience, where the brain might amplify uh, you know, something that's not that painful into something that's very painful, or it might just generate painful experience independently of that right. identifiable source. So we, at my colleagues um, at the Center for Consciousness Science at the University of Michigan, which I direct, and also at the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, we've been starting to collaborate to take some network-based approaches to thinking about chronic pain um, as a state of consciousness with the hope that if we understood the network and we understood the network behavior, and that's where my colleagues from physics are, are taking ideas that come from network science and applying them to the brain and to states of consciousness, perhaps we could model uh, we can take information from individual patients, we can generate computational models, we could test different modulations of the model, and then we could ultimately go back into patients with some sort of therapeutic intervention. You know, for example, non-invasive brain stimulation or even deep brain stimulation, which is something that's being mm -hmm. used very successfully for Parkinson's, uh, for some other disorders. And I, I think that's uh, an ambitious research program, uh, but something that is um, actually conceivable uh, and doable. Wonderful. Yeah, that would be awesome. Even better than science fiction. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Okay. Um, well, those, those were the questions that I had for you, but I also like to, you know, leave it open to you. Uh, number one, if I have any glaring omission, like I can't believe you didn't ask me this. You know, is there something I, I, I did not ask you that I should have asked you? Or is there anything else, you know, in addition to what we discussed that you'd like to bring up or, you know, even outside of consciousness per se, just something you'd like to, you know, to, to share or discuss, you know, anything like that? Just an opportunity for you to, you know, put anything out there that we may not have covered or that you want to get covered. Sure. Um, so I'm going to give you one specific thing that I think is interesting that has come out of my work and trying to uh, figure out how to monitor consciousness in the setting of anesthesia and surgery, uh, and then a, a more general reflection. So first of all, it was really interesting um, that in about 2012, I had a colleague of mine from physiology, Dr. Jimo Borjigan, who's a neuroscientist, who works in circadian rhythms and uh, the pineal gland, uh, to ask me about measuring consciousness in animals. And as we uh, started talking about it, it became clear that she was interested in understanding what happened in the animal's brains when they died. She had been um, doing neurochemistry for, for a set of experiments and uh, a few rodents unfortunately died overnight uh, during the course of that mm. experiment. And she saw these enormous surges in neurochemicals and started wondering what effect that had on the brain. Now, you would imagine that if you weren't getting oxygen to your brain and your neurons couldn't maintain their membrane integrity, that you would just start spilling neurochemistry and the brain could go haywire. But we know that there's certain states of consciousness that can emerge in that near-death state. Right. Fact, they're called the near-death experience. And these are right. vivid, often transformational uh, states of consciousness. So... What's going on? Um, some people would say that it's a supernatural event. Some people say it's more psychological. But for somebody like myself or Dr. Borgian, who uh, is interested in the neurobiology of consciousness and would say that any experience is coming from the brain, we wanted to know, are there neural correlates of that near-death experience? And so we conducted uh, a test in an animal model and using some of the techniques that we had been um, studying to look at state transitions of consciousness in humans. And we found that after experimental cardiac arrest or after experimental respiratory arrest, that in fact, there was uh, an apparent surge uh, 
of some of the connectivity patterns that we had noticed to be associated with consciousness or returning consciousness in humans and other animal models. So I think that was a, a really interesting collaboration that generated a lot of discussion uh, just because of the topic uh, and was just worth noting here. The other more general yeah. reflection um, that I would like to conclude with is that, you know, this is a really remarkable time, I think, in history uh, for us to have some emerging tools to be able to study this topic and to be able to talk about it uh, in the academic setting without it being considered fringe or be able to have a wonderful conversation as I've had with you uh, for the past 40 minutes or so. Uh, and, you know, just to put this into context, I, I was um, reading uh, some work on quantum physics and thinking about that early phase in which quantum physics was unfolding. It was just getting almost emotional as a scientist thinking about how remarkable it must have been to see those fundamental uh, aspects of the world, of the physical world, you know, just unfold and be revealed uh, in the course of the scientific exploration. And then it suddenly struck me, you know, because I, and I, I should say, I was thinking how amazing it would have been to be a scientist in that field in that time. And then it struck right. me that actually I'm living through this now and I'm not making an analogy between myself and these famous Nobel prize winning uh, quantum physicists. But even as somebody who's, you know, playing any role, even as an engaged community member, we're all partaking of a really remarkable journey on a question that, in my opinion, is every bit as profound as the nature of the physical world, and that is the, the nature of our phenomenological world. Right. It's a question that people have been asking since people have been able to ask questions. Um, and we're, we're at this remarkable point where we have some interesting theories, um, some compelling theories that are making uh, important predictions, successfully so, uh, emerging technology, uh, passion, scientific acceptance that this is a legitimate field. So I just wanted to convey my enthusiasm and uh, my sense of gratitude uh, to be able to be a, a part of this and play any even small part um, in the ongoing discourse. Yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, just hearing you talk like that has me excited because there's so much potential there. And I'm, I'm really grateful for uh, people like you who are bringing us, you know, to that point, because it, I do, I get a similar sense. You know, I studied quantum physics in college, and I remember having a professor that said, you know, if you're feeling lost, you're getting it. But if you feel like you're, you're getting it, you're lost. And that's kind of the, the moment we were with quantum physics. It was, it was kind of you know, we weren't quite there, but there's so much has come out even in the last 25 years. It has really uh, been amazing. And I, I, as a layman, I do see, you know, some of these things emerging like that. So I'm glad to hear your excitement. And I can tell you for those of us who are watching you guys grow this and, and analyze this and create models, you know, from the outside, it, it's very exciting for us too. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for uh, inviting me to speak with you. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, Dr. Mershore. I really appreciate your time. That concludes another edition of the Consciousness Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Please find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash the Consciousness Podcast at our Twitter handle at ConchCast. And don't forget to subscribe to our feed at theconsciousnesspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.